Welcome to The Strategic Investor. Join us as we interview some of the world's most productive asset managers and uncover sophisticated and unique investment strategies in the markets. Here is your host, Charlie Wright. Hello and welcome to Strategic Investor Radio on OC Talk Radio, where we bring you investment strategies you are not hearing elsewhere, and you will definitely say that after listening to today's interview. We're very pleased to bring with us for the very first time Sal Gilberti, co-founder, president, and chief investment officer of Tucrium, which is a family of exchange-traded products, ETPs, all on agricultural commodities. And uh, they're headquartered in Wilmington, Delaware. Sal, welcome to Strategic Investor Radio. Happy to be here, Charlie. Thank you for having me. So, Sal, you've got a background in agricultural commodities trading, starting with Cargill, moving on to Bear Stearns, SockGen, uh, extensive experience in the ethanol market, which makes you probably one of a handful of people who started out there. Uh, you have ETPs in corn, soybeans, sugar, and wheat. So give us a little of your background, will you? Sure. I, I did start, as you, as you said, in, in, um, way back in 1982, trading leaded gasoline for Cargill. And that, that actually helped me a lot. A couple things I learned there. One is the first thing they said to us in, in training, which was, I, it always stuck with me. The guy walked into a room with 30 or 40 of us to, be, to get our indoctrination into, into the Cargill way, if you will, and which was wonderful. And he said, the first thing you need to remember is it doesn't have to rain. And that, that always stuck with me. And that actually is something that we should remember in, in our talking, because the price of corn, and we'll probably get to it, has actually doubled twice in the past 11 years from the exact same spot, both times because it didn't rain. That, that's, that was my start at Cargill. I ended up, uh, years later, um, starting the ethanol over-the-counter swap markets. And that leaded gasoline at Cargill experience, I took them from leaded to unleaded. And then when people started having trouble with unleaded gasoline, the additive MTBE, which poisons groundwater, I heard George Bush give a speech, George Bush the Younger, about ethanol. And I thought, wow, I used to blend gasoline and this stuff, you can drink it. It's just, it's grain alcohol. And I, I really think that that's the future for gasoline. And so I, I wrote a swap and got it going. And that, that started apparently the, the ethanol over the counter markets and that, that swap itself is a cleared swap now on the on the CME. It does so you're the one to blame, huh, Sal? Uh, I am. I am indeed. And and but I, I found it fascinating that you know, people most people don't know that an ethanol plant has to poison the ethanol. It's called denaturing. And they actually inject two percent gasoline into the tank of ethanol before it pulls out on a rail car because otherwise they wouldn't be able to ship it interstate. They'd need a liquor license. So you you can you can drink it. Fascinating. I was uh, totally unaware of that here. So, so tell us here, uh, Sal, what do you know about investing in agricultural commodities that you wish everybody knew? Well, the, the number one thing is that you should invest in agricultural commodities, that, that good allocators should consider investing in agricultural commodities because there is a secret to them. One is, we, you know, we've come up with these exchange-traded products to kind of be a little self-serving. We, I started these ETPs, these, these exchange-traded products, with really good tickers, like our corn fund has the ticker corn on the New York Stock Exchange. It's easy to get so that people can participate without trading futures. And the reason people should look at, at agricultural commodities, when you, when you look at some of the um, intellectual studies and the academic studies at the universities, they'll, very often they'll come up with the conclusion that investing in agriculture over a very long term really doesn't work because they, they kind of revert back to their cost of production. And so if you buy and hold it forever, that really doesn't help you. You know, you buy Apple stock or you buy gold. Everybody remembers when they deregulated gold and, you know, went from 200 bucks an ounce to wherever it is now, 1200 bucks an ounce. It's kind of a, it, it's a steep upward sloping, you know, going to the right on a chart. Hopefully. Um, right, hopefully. But most of the time it goes up. And, and over long periods of time it goes up. Ags don't do that. The secret to agriculture is that farmers will plant until something goes to its cost of production. Their job is to plant. They're the eternal optimists. They're the ultimate gamblers. They scratch dirt. They bet on rain and weather and fire and pestilence, all the biblical things that people think are just biblical. Well, farmers live them every day. And occasionally it doesn't rain or you lose a crop for some reason. And prices go crazy because as the world population gets bigger and as we find more and more uses for grains like ethanol, 
every single year, the combined use of corn, soybeans, and wheat rises. It's either a record or the second highest ever when you look back at a chart. And so you're either a record or the second best record usage every single year because of a rising population. And the population um, is rising at two and a half people a second. That means nothing to me. But when you think about it, it's twice the population of California. So the world's population is growing at a rate of twice the population of California every year. And every year, those people need food and all supplies and all commodities. So not only are commodities a good investment in general, which is you know my background, but agricultural commodities get driven to their cost of production by a farmer. And that's when is your opportunity to layer those in to a portfolio, and you wait. It's, it's, a, it's a wait strategy. But the buy and hold for all eternity that the academics use, yeah, it doesn't work. But everybody in the world who's real rebalances. They do it quarterly, they do it annually, or they do it when their money doubles. And yeah. that's, that's what you need to do with that. That's the secret. That's what I wish everyone knew. You know, uh, Sal, uh, we met at a conference uh, months ago, and uh, you, you showed a chart at that conference that <laughs> really made a compelling point. And uh, you showed a chart of the price of corn, and uh, that it bottoms uh, not only periodically, but at the same place. And as I recall, it was bottoming at about that same place at that particular time. And you showed how cyclical it is, how seasonal, actually, it is. Um, which, again, in, in the normal world of equities, they're not seasonal. Uh, that's correct. But corn is highly seasonal, and there's a reason. It's cosmic. Most of the world's corn, almost 70% of the world's corn, is grown in the northern hemisphere, north of the equator. So as the earth tilts and it becomes summertime, that's when corn is grown. And when the earth tilts the other way and it becomes wintertime, no one's growing anything. And so what happens is all the vast majority of corn grown in the world is grown in the United States and China believe it or not. And so, but China uses all its corn. It doesn't export. So you, 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 their, their production kind of gets lost in the, in the haze out there. But the, the reality is the vast majority of corn in the world is grown in the northern hemisphere in the summer. So it's harvested in a six to ten week time period in the autumn. If you look at seasonal charts that are smooth for 20 and 30 years, all else being equal, and yes, all else is never equal. But most of the time when there is no drought, all of the corn is harvested at the same time. So the, the, you've got this giant pile of corn, in essence. So the buyers get complacent, and, and sellers are saying, well, I'm not going to sell at the seasonal low, so they kind of sit. So right at harvest, and it tends to happen around the first week of October for spot corn, for nearby corn, you, you tend to get this price low. But remember, every day, people come and take a little bit out of that pile, every single day. And in the deep winter, nothing's growing. No seeds are planted, save for a few in the southern hemisphere. And the pile is getting smaller. And what people don't realize about grains is um, they can't be stored very long. So corn, uh, I remember the first time I visited a a field of grain elevators, and and the the gentleman who owned the elevators was walking us around. He said, yeah, I've got to get rid of the corn in that elevator. It's been there four years. I'm thinking, four years? Really? No wonder a bag of Fritos. Sometimes it tastes really good and sometimes it's kind of average. How how can I be eating four-year-old corn? But that's about the maximum. If the temperature and humidity is right in that grain elevator, they can store corn for four years, and then it's done. But the key here is that at the end of every year, when you add up all that's been harvested and you take away all that will be used for the next crop year, on average, what's left is maybe a couple of months. So if there were to be a crop failure, if something were to happen that, that's unforeseen or it just doesn't rain, what happens if you have an eight-week supply of corn and no corn grows? That means the world runs out of corn in eight weeks. Now, that's not going to happen because corn's you know grown in a lot of places. But what happens is when you get a drought, say, in the United States, the world's largest producer and exporter of corn, now all of a sudden that eight weeks in a single year can go to six weeks or even four weeks. And what if there's a back-to-back drought? And, in fact, that, that happened in, in 2010 and then again in 2012. And the price of corn, exactly as you say, the, the break-even for corn is easy to see. Look at a chart. And it's, it's very easy. The, the futures equivalent price of between 350 and $4 is the break-even of corn. That is the break-even of corn. What happens is a farmer plants and drives that price down to between 350 and $4. It will stay there until one day it stops raining or there's some other supply disruption. And suddenly the price rockets higher because the market's terrified. The stocks, the minimum stocks at eight weeks going to four, what if you get back to back and you go to zero? There isn't enough corn. Markets in ags trade at break-even, and then they panic. 
And that therein lies the opportunity for investors. When you see corn futures trading around 350, your downside is really limited because farmers will just stop planting. That's what they'll do. Can it go to $3? Of course it can. Will it stay there? If you look back at a chart in the post-ethanol era, it hasn't happened for more than six or eight weeks, and it goes back up. So, but when it doubles, the price of corn has been above $7 three times in the last 11 years. And twice it came from the 350 to $4 area and went to the 7 to 750 area. And once it went from the $5 area to the almost $8, well, above $8. And that happened in 2012 because there was, uh, there was a, another drought in the two-year time period. Generally, supply interruptions in corn happen every five to seven years. If you have one happen in every two or three years, supplies start to shrink. Those ending stocks start to shrink. That eight weeks goes to six, goes to four, maybe goes to two. Things get tight. Prices go up. So the opportunity for investors is when you see something at its cost of production, understand that it has limited downside. Understand that, as we said earlier, demand just keeps rising. So Econ 101, rising demand uncertain supply, in those years when supply becomes uncertain, the price goes up. And investors can take advantage of that really easily now. There's future, there are futures, and there are now these ETP products. Okay, so, so let's talk about uh, those two things here. So your ETP product, does it invest in futures? Uh, how, how does that work, and how does that work for the end investor? It invests in futures. And so what happened is we, we kind of stuck, um, we did stick the commodities and in, in, in specifically agricultural commodities into the ETF-like wrapper. So they're called ETPs because technically we don't have 20 holdings, so legally we're not an ETF or an ETP, but we're exactly like an ETF. We're a Delaware Series Trust. Your money is collateralized. Um, I can get hit by a bus or two grams can go out of business. You still get all your money back. It's not like a Lehman note where when Lehman went under, people lost their money in the ETNs. This is not an unsecured note. It's a collateralized instrument that trades on the New York Stock Exchange every day. Its liquidity, like all ETFs, is based on its underlying. So when you look at any ETF, it's bid and ask. Never put a market order in. Always put a, put a limit order in. Because a machine will just calculate the underlying, where it can buy it, and where it can sell to you if you happen to be buying that, that ETF or ETP. And so the corn markets on a, on a report day will trade decabillions of value. There's no amount of money any registered investment advisor or any investor, in fact, can put into the, the corn ETP, for instance, on the New York Stock Exchange, that's going to move the corn markets. They're, it's just impossible. Just do it when futures markets are trading. So in all ETFs, for good liquidity, no matter what, what the underlying is, be it commodities or stocks. If you trade that ETF when the underlying markets are open and you avoid the very open of the New York Stock Exchange, 930, you should, you should wait till 945-ish to put your orders in and use limit orders. There's almost an infinite amount of liquidity that you can get in things like grain ETFs, like corn and wheat and soybeans, like ours, because the, the underlying is infinite. So what do we do? We take your money when we're, we don't actually get it directly, a, a bank makes markets. So as a sponsor, I don't actually sell shares to anyone. Um, I do creation baskets to a bank who makes a market. Uh, you know, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, um, Virtu, Susquehanna, all the big traders are out there making markets in our funds. And if you need to buy, you know, one or, or a million shares of one of our funds, corn, wheat, soybeans, or, or even sugar, you put your order in, that bank will sell it to you based on the price of the underlying. And then they will come to us and do what's called a creation basket. That's how ETFs work. It's a very smooth process. All the investor sees is, you know, corn is for sale for X dollars and X cents on the, on the stock exchange, and they buy it, the corn ETF. What happens with that money is it immediately goes into three corn futures. It goes into the second month, we never hold spot, corn future, the third month corn future, and the December following third month. And this is really important. You own out the curve. So we never own spot. You're never going to get delivery. We're never, you know, there's, this is all paper. And you're never going to have the, the um, terrible effects of, of slippage of, of, of this um, backwardation and contango, that they call it, where sometimes you can have negative roll yield, which you might hear that term with ETFs. Oh, we, yeah. We've mitigated that by spreading our holdings. So your money actually goes in. It buys three futures contracts, 35%, 30%, and 35%. And... And we post those, those holdings on our website the same day, so generally by 6 p.m. Um, and the law requires all ETF uh, providers do this within 24 hours. We do it same day at, at 6 p.m. You can see on our website, 6 p.m. or you know, around that time, 
all the futures we bought, you can see exactly what the what the fund holds, and you know what you hold. And so what about leverage? Because futures market uh, is all about leverage here. We are not leveraged. So if, if a dollar comes into our funds, we buy $1 worth of corn. We do not leverage. These are not leveraged products. These are meant to give investors exposure. They are not meant um, to, to, to do anything but if an investor is long our corn fund and corn goes up, our fund goes up. And if an investor is short, you know, uh, long our corn fund and corn goes down, our corn fund will go down. That's, that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to give an investor direct but easy exposure to the corn futures markets without having a futures account. You trade them on the New York Stock Exchange in your, you know, in your e-broker account or your, your RIA account, however you do it. That's, that's why we did this. And we did it so that people could buy and hold them, so that people don't have to worry about rolling futures. We do that for you. It's a formula. So you know what you're going to own inside of our fund when you buy it, the day you buy it, and you know 10 years from now. You can look at a calendar. You'll know what we're going to own. And we, in fact, post a calendar one or two years out on every month what our holdings will be as the, as the futures contracts roll off. And this is to give people an opportunity, for instance, when corn, like it is now with all the tariff turmoil, it, it's trading at 350 or below on some of the futures contracts. That's at break even in the fields or less. So risk, it would seem, history would tell us, is very limited on the downside. Yet your upside, should it not rain this summer or next summer, this is the time price level where people will be layering uh, corn and soybeans and wheat into their portfolio and holding it, waiting for that drought that, that will come. We've, this will be our sixth, if we have a good year, which everyone's predicting weather, this will be the sixth year in a row that we have truly spectacular weather. We've rebuilt our stocks. And corn really does trade down between 350 and 4. It, it's only a matter of time. History tells you it's only a matter of time before there's a supply disruption. Demand does not fall, it rises. So, Sal, well, what are the major objections that you run into from investors or their advisors on uh, investing through in these agricultural commodity products? Um, well, two, two things. One is people want to get paid to hold something. And, and we, don't, you know, we don't have an ability to pay to pay right. a dividend. These right. are, these, right. We simply own the futures contracts. We're not a, yeah. a corn producer. We, we don't, you know, we're, we're not stocks. We, we own futures. Um, second, most people, they don't think about ags. And they say, how do I explain to my clients why I'm invested in ags? And, you know, once you spend a few minutes with them, we've touched on some of the things now, and you, I think you saw our, our booth or our presentation at the show where we met. People get convinced pretty quickly that, wow, I should have an exposure to that. I mean, you wake up in the morning. People don't understand. They say, well, did I use corn today? I didn't eat. You know, they're thinking, did they eat an ear of corn at their summer picnic? Well, if, if you filled up your car w- with gasoline today, you used about a bushel of corn. The average SUV uses about a bushel of corn in the ethanol content of the gasoline. That's corn's second largest global use. Corn's first largest global use is if your kids, you know, jump out of the car and buy a beef jerky stick or a chicken taco or something – is feeding animals. So you, you just use corn twice. If you go inside and pull something out of that cooler to drink, it's probably sweetened with corn syrup. That's corn's third largest use. And when you pay for it all, if you're still signing and not using you know, Apple Pay, if you're still signing credit card slip or you're taking notes listening to this right now, that paper is held together with cornstarch. That's corn's fourth largest use. It is not possible for you to be in any country anywhere in the world and not use corn on a given day. It's not possible. And that's what people don't realize. They're using grains every day. When the price of oil goes below $40 a barrel, billions of dollars pour into oil ETPs. Billions of dollars. Same with gold. Gold gets under 1100 gets toward $1,000 an ounce. Billions of dollars flow into those things. Corn gets under 350 Nobody cares. And they should. That's, that's my biggest frustration. That's what keeps me up at night. I know you asked that on your podcast. <laughs> that, that's what keeps me up at night. Why don't people pay attention to grains? How, you have limited downside and really high upside when grains are at their cost of production. And most of the time, they trade at their cost of production. And there's a seasonal. So for corn, for instance, not only do you watch the price and, and you know, start to allocate there, but you, you watch the calendar. And if there hasn't been a drought the prior summer, come you know, the first week of October, you're buying into that that dip when and you generally you see this creep up through March, basically from October to March you see an upward seasonal creep in corn because after March the seeds start getting planted in the ground people start feeling a little more optimistic and prices tend to level off and then they they tend to fall 
um, as you get into midsummer, and you can see if it's going to rain or not during that critical pollination time, which is generally around the 4th of July, shortly after. So, Sal, uh, who buys your fund and why? That's a good question because we don't uh, sell directly to people, but we, we do see the, the, the tax um, rolls once a year. We have to, we have to you know, send out our tax forms. And um, it seems to be up 50-50, retail investors and retail advisors. And so um, our, our top holders of our funds constantly, in term, every year we get what's, every month we get what's called a um, Depository Trust Clearing Corporation account. It's a quasi-governmental organization, and they tell us all the clearing members that are holding our accounts. So I can't see the individuals, but I can see what firm holding our funds. And every single month the top three are TD Ameritrade, um, Schwab, and Fidelity. And they have enormous RIA, independent broker-dealer platforms. And that's, that's where the money's coming from. Well, very interesting. So tell us, uh, uh, you, you've already told us what keeps you awake at night. What book on investing would you recommend for our listeners? You know, I'm not a big fan of investment books, but I will tell you that the, the one I like the best, with hands down, is the original Market Wizards, written in the late 80s. You, you may remember it. And is that Jack uh, Schwager? Yes, Jack yeah. Schwager. And Schwager, the right. reason I like that book was that it had... I tend not to read a, a, a book or any article that gives one point of view because I, I might get hung up on it. It might affect you know my my balanced outlook. That book interviewed a lot of superstar hedge fund managers and traders, and each one of them gave a different perspective. But the the two key things I remember clear as a bell taken away from that book is one is every one of them that was successful focused on managing downside risk, and every bad trade I've ever been my whole life was because I lost sight of that. There's no, no question about that. Managing your losses is much more important than managing your potential gains. And second, I remember a quote from Paul Tudor Jones who said, every single morning when he woke up and looked at his book, if he wouldn't have initiated that position, he presented, he, didn't, he pretended he didn't have any of the positions that were in his book, and he'd look at each one of them individually and say to himself, would I buy this today if I didn't own it? And if the answer wasn't yes, he would sell. And those, those two things really stuck with me from that book. You know, those are great, great points here. So for those who would like to know more, number one, spell Tucrium, and uh, number two, uh, give them uh, some contact and website information. Sure. Tucrium is uh, it's an herb. It's T-E-U-C-R-I-U-M. And if you go to Tucrium.com, you, uh, a page, a web page will come up that links you then to all of our funds, and you can click on the picture of corn or the picture of wheat or soybeans or sugar cubes and, and get to that specific fund. Um, if you just Google corn fund, our fund usually comes up. So there's an easy way to find us. And, and there, there's um, info at, at tucrim.com if you really want to write to us. If you want to speak with me directly, I'm, I'm always available at sal.gilberti. That's Gilbert with an IE at the end at tucrim.com. Just shoot me an email and um, I will answer you. Great. So final words for our listeners here, Sal. Final words, do pay attention to ags. They are, there are enormous opportunities. When you see corn in particular, it gets headlines um, at, at 350, um, a bushel futures equivalent. That really is a time to start thinking about layering in. And the headline will tell you. I mean, set, it, set an alert for yourself or something. But the headlines when there's a drought will tell you that it's, it's time to probably sell that. Okay. Well, Sal, thank you very much. This has been very interesting. And again, not a topic that uh, we talk about a whole lot. And certainly in Southern California at uh, Saturday gatherings around the neighborhood is not something that usually comes up buying into uh, ag products here. So uh, thank you very much for enlightening us. And we appreciate it. And our best uh, wishes to you and to Cream for continued success. Thanks very much, Charlie. Really appreciate the opportunity. Again, we've been talking with Sal Gilberti, co-founder, president, and chief investment officer of Tucrium out of Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, you've been listening to Strategic Investor Radio on OC Talk Radio. We'd love to have you contact us at strategicinvestorradio.com. Go to our website to hear podcasts of all of our interviews and shows, strategicinvestorradio.com. I'm Charlie Wright, wishing you an enjoyable week and productive investing. Strategic Investor Radio is a production of OC Talk Radio and is provided for educational purposes only. 
Content of this program and the views of the guests should not be considered as recommendations by OC Talk Radio or investment advice from the host, Charlie Wright, or any other entity attached to this production. Investors should always consult qualified financial, investment, tax, or legal professionals prior to investing. 